6, Philippians 1, 6. It is important to notice, I'm looking at the English, it doesn't really show it in the English, but in the Greek in which the New Testament was written, verses 3 through 7 is one Greek sentence, one Greek sentence. Uh, Let's say I'm just looking, I see in the English, it looks like three. But in the Greek, there's only one Greek sentence, which means one completed thought. When you start reading verse three, you go through verse seven, it's one completed thought. And it's kind of important to our study today, you understand that. For example, the main verb of this sentence is in verse three. Uh, when Paul said, I thank my God. And the rest of the structure are participles and things of that nature that work off that main verb. And so Paul is writing out of the book of Philippians uh, a heart filled with gratitude. Uh, we call it, when it thinks about grace, we call it the attitude of gratitude. Uh, the attitude of gratitude. Uh, he speaks of what God was able to do a, a, as he went in there as a missionary, preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. These people were converted, and uh, he began teaching them, and before he left, they formed a church. It was a wonderful thing, the church at Philippi. Uh, just in case you didn't get the first time. <laughs> Just in case you didn't get the first time. So in verse 6, in verse 6, is where the subject of my sermon comes from. Confidence of your salvation. And he is thankful to God that these people got saved and they got into the word of God and now have confidence about their great salvation. And so he talks about that in verse 6. I am confident of this very thing, verse 5, your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. The confidence of salvation is all about God and it's not about you. It's all about God. The confidence of your salvation lies not in your weaknesses, but in the strengths of God. Now listen to what he said. I am confident of this very thing, which he has said from verses three through five, that he, God, who began a good work in you, salvation, will complete it. See, the word perfect means to complete. We'll complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, which is a rapture. The day of Christ Jesus is the day of the rapture of the church. That's a powerful idea. You should be able to have the confidence of your salvation from the moment you got saved until Christ returns. If you believe personally, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, not for his, died for yours, was buried and on the third day raised from the dead, it's called the gospel. When you believe it, you receive it. It's called being saved. It's your salvation. God gave it to you then and he holds it until the day of redemption. You don't hold your salvation. What you hold is your confidence. Confidence. Pastoral confidence. So we're going to talk about that today after a word of prayer. Let us pray. As a believer in Christ, indwelt by the Holy Spirit because of the new covenant, we live in the church age. It is important that the Holy Spirit minister his work 
in the teaching hour of teach and recall, John 14, 26. He can't do that if there's knowledge of personal sin because you're in carnality. Personal sin is evidence of carnality. You have to confess your sin to get back to spirituality, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour. It could be mental attitude type sin. It could be sin of the tongue or overt sin. That should be confessed according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. It is the blood of Christ that cleanses you at salvation. It is the blood of Christ that continues that process, not for salvation, but for sanctification. It is about the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. I give you a moment. Do business with the Lord personally. It's your soul that's accountable. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way to study. study with us. The confidence of salvation is described by Paul in the book of Philippians 1, 3 through 7, with emphasis on verse 6. The confidence, the pastul, the confidence that we have in this very thing, that God began that work and God will continue that work till the day of the rapture or the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. And I'm so thankful, Father, that we are in your hands and not our own when it comes to the salvation program. Encourage our hearts today, Father, as we look for confidence of our salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I mentioned this. I put at the, the second column on your paper, I wrote out, and I want you to take a look at that. I wrote out uh, Philippians 1.6. Notice that the word confidence is, is uh, patho, patho, patho. It's a perfect active participle, patho. It's a pre perfect active participle, non nominative singular masculine, if you want to know what all those terms are. It's Greek. It's, but listen, the perfect tense is important here. The word confidence I, Paul, Paul wrote, I am confident of this very thing that he, God, who began a work, a good work in you, will perfect it unto the day of Christ. His confidence is in God who has brought salvation to your life. He will continue that good work, right, until the day of Jesus, until the Lord comes back a second time. His confidence is not in them. His confidence is in God. Did you get that? Don't miss that now. Your confidence in your salvation is the confidence you have in God. Uh, what Paul said, he begins a good work in you the moment you believe, you receive. And Paul said, my confidence is in God who saved you the first day and will continue to the last day or until the Christ returns. That's important that you understand that. The perfect tense, I am, I am confident that God would do this. Paul is saying, my confidence is in God that he would do it. He puts, it, puts the word confidence in the perfect tense, which means completed action in the past. When they got saved, Paul went in, preached the gospel, and they got saved. They made professions of faith. Out of that came Bible study, and out of that came a church. And Paul's confidence is that that work that began in their life is going to last until the second coming of Christ. That's, that's pretty powerful. That God that began, well, you're missing this. See the word began? See the word began? Say, I am confident, perfect tense, I'm, the, I'm confident about God's salvation. That it's all about God. It's not about you. It's all about God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Not perish and have everlasting life is all the, work, the good work of God. Every bit of that is all the good work of God in salvation. Our confidence today is in God who saves man when he believes and is capable of keeping him from that day of salvation to the day of Christ's return. That's a pretty powerful idea that Paul has said. 
Is confidence in the perfect tense, is completed action where the results are remains completed, my confidence from that first day to now and forever is in God who has saved you and will keep you saved until the day of Christ. That's a pretty powerful idea. So he says, my confidence of this very thing, that, and that's a declarative, that God, who began a good work, that's a participle, a good work, ergod, agathos ergod, in you will perfect it. And I'm going to talk about that word perfect in a minute. We'll perfect it until the day of Christ. Now here's what you can't see in the English, but I want you to see in the Greek. I got three things. Watch on your paper. I said note three times. Note this, note this, do that. So note number one, number two, and number three. Now watch this. Note that there are two participles. They're working off a main verb. Remember that three through seven is one Greek sentence. The main verb is I am thankful. I thank my God is what this works off from. There are two participles that work off from I thank my God. Here are two reasons, participles, here are two reasons that Paul's thankful to God for their salvation and his confidence is in God that their salvation will be until the coming of Christ. Now watch these two participles. Notice that the first participle is a perfect participle. It's the word confidence in verse 6. Notice that the second one, he who began, is a participle. These two participles work off from verse 3, I thank my God, which is the main verb. Participles are working off main verbs. It's the same in the English. I'm just telling you how it is here so you can get it. Working off, I thank my God, is what these two participles, this is what he is thankful about. One, he is thankful about the confidence that Paul has in God's work of salvation. When a person believes, he receives, and God holds him. God holds him until the day of Christ. So the first participle, Paul's talking about, I am thankful that I have the confidence in God of your salvation. And the second particle, the second participle says, he who began, I my confidence in God because it is God who began a good work, who began a good work in you and will hold you until the day of Jesus Christ. You got that? These are two participles. Here's where his confidence is. It is in God who began the work of salvation in you, will continue that work of salvation on, uh, uh, onto you until Jesus returns. Do you understand that? That's the two participles of what Paul's so thankful about. Okay. That's really important. Note the second, the second thing I noted for you that's important for you to understand. Note that these two participles are the content of the confidence of salvation. He said, he, God, who began a good work in you, he, God, will perfect it, complete it, or finish it at the day of the, day of the return of Christ. When he says the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's talking about what we say, the rapture or the return of Christ, second coming of Christ. <clears throat> Listen to me. Your salvation is not based on you. It's based on God. Do you understand that? The assurance of your salvation comes, comes from the scriptures. I am confident, Paul said, of the teaching that what God began, God is able to keep. You understand that? See, that's grace. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So this is really important. You get this because, listen, people all over the place, they say, well, I know I was saved at some point, but I don't think I am anymore. Look, if you're saved at one point, you're saved forever. Just because you're living carnal don't mean you're not saved. And if you're living carnal and won't come out of it, you'll be divinely disciplined. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, you'll be disciplined. 
You're not going to get away with anything. But God still holds your salvation. You don't hold it. He holds it. Only thing you can hold is confidence. He holds your salvation. I mean, if you, if you want to be a jerk and live in carnality, be a jerk, but you're going to be disciplined because God loves you. Hebrews 12, he's going to discipline you for that. He's not going to, you're not going to get away. People say, well, the, you, you know, you preach that anybody gets saved, just live like they want to. I don't preach that. Can't live like you want to. You belong to God. He purchased you with the blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Well, anyhow, this is what Paul, now, here's what you're missing. That's okay. But notice when I said, note these two participles, one participle is heiress and the other participle is perfect. At the point in time that he began a good work, point of salvation, the moment you believe the gospel, God now has you in his grasp. You belong to God. That's a wonderful thing. You belong to God. You, belong, you don't belong to the world anymore. Quick, go back to the world. The world's got nothing. Listen, when the world suck all your blood out and leave you empty. The world's got nothing to give you. The world's got nothing to give you. It's all temporary, right? The Bible says even in sin, there's pleasure for just a fleeting second. Then it's gone, right? Then you have to go back to the well of the world and drink, right? I mean, that don't last long. You got to go back for another dip or whatever you're in. The final note of the confidence of salvation is in the perfect tense, but watch this. I wrote it on your paper. In the Greek, it's powerful. I, I, I wrote it out for you so you would not miss it. It's E-P-I, look down there, T-E-L-E-O. See that E-P-I on the front of that word is a preposition. And the word teleo means to finish complete, to finish something or complete something. Now watch me. Watch this, watch this now. Because you'll miss this. He added the preposition on front of the word to complete, to overemphasize it. Who began your salvation experience? Who? God. God. Who holds it in his firm grasp? God. Who's going to hold you to the second coming of Christ? God. Now, Paul wrote this word, epi, teleo. When he put the preposition on front, here's what it meant. Fully. Fu say fully. Fully completed. See, he could have said T E uh, L E O, which means to be complete, but he overemphasized it. Fully, say fully. Fully completed. Fully completed. Why? Because God began it, God keeps it until the day of Jesus Christ. You got that? Fully. Huh? He didn't just say finished. He didn't just say full. Uh, he said fully complete. That's a pretty powerful idea. I didn't want you to miss that because that's a pretty powerful idea. Now, I want to talk about four things today in the first service. Paul is confident that he has taught them well on the doctrine of grace salvation so that they have confidence they can never lose it. How, why is it that you can never lose your salvation once you believe the gospel? Because of what? Faith. Who started it? Faith. Who started it? God. God. Who keeps it? God. Until Christ returns, who keeps it? God. How about that? There's where your confidence lies. There's where your confidence of your salvation that's your confidence of your salvation. Paul is confident and he is thankful that he has the confidence that he has taught them well on the doctrine of grace salvation so they have a confidence they can never lose it. Can you lose your salvation? Don't let me lie to you. You can't lose your salvation. Either that, Paul's a liar and the Bible's a liar. He said you can't do that. Why? 
Who began it? Who holds it? Until the coming of Christ. There you go. It's not probation, it's salvation. Thank you. So, patho, patho, in the perfect active participle, in the perfect tense, this word patho is an interesting word because it means to be persuaded. Persuade is kind of an interesting idea. Isn't it? Hello. Why did you knock on my door? I want to sell you some insurance. I've got plenty. I don't need any. So what do you have to be to buy it? You have to be persuaded, right? I mean, it, it involves in all kinds of relationships, right? I want to get married. I don't think right now I have to be persuaded, right? Persuaded is a kind of an interesting word because we're talking about somebody Whose, ha whose mind has to be changed a little bit. Persuaded. It's interesting the way it's used in a court of law where Paul was arguing his case before King Agrippa for preaching the gospel of grace salvation. It's in Acts, and later you can read this, but it's in Acts 26. And King Agrippa listened to Paul talk to, talking about why he preached the gospel of grace salvation. Paul was so strong in his argument that King Agrippa, over the court proceedings, said this. In a short time, Paul you will persuade me to become a Christian. Paul answered, I would to God that whether in a short time or a long time, not only you, but all who are hearing me this day in court might become such as I without being imprisoned. And that's um, what did he say? What did King Agrippa say? Paul's argument was so strong, he was almost persuaded. Almost persuaded. Almost won't get you saved. Almost won't get you saved. Almost won't get you saved. You got to believe it. Paul said, Christ came into the world and died for sin. I was the worst of it. I was a religious sinner who didn't think he needed to be. And God intervened in my life in a dramatic way, because I was so hard-headed and persuaded me that Jesus Christ came into the world to die for sinners. I lifted my hand and I said to him, I think I'm the worst. I'm a religious sinner. And he said, I take all kinds of sinners. You're welcome in my kingdom. But you got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And I can change your status from sinner to saint. Just like that. Isn't that a marvelous thing? It's a marvelous thing. I remember that day like it was yesterday in my life. At 23. Was persuaded. To believe that Jesus died for Ron Adema and was buried and raised from the dead if there was no one else. He was willing to save me if nobody else would. What a wonderful idea that is. Changed my life forever. Changed. Now, I, look, I say that all the time. Somebody says, Well, I don't want to be no preacher. Look, I, that's a sidebar. I got saved. I got saved because I knew I was a sinner. And I knew that that was a life that just drained everything out of me and gave me nothing back. It took everything from me and gave me nothing. 
just temporary something. Then it was gone. Now it was worse shape after I left it than when I started it. Not so with salvation. God begins a good work, a good work, and he holds that good work in process all the way to the second coming of Christ. We should be so thankful. Paul said, I am so thankful to be able to share that truth with you. And I feel the same way in my heart. D down there in Hebrews, look at Hebrews 9, 5, 9, down, down that little ways. And having been made perfect, see, that's teleo, -o. that's the word perfect. In the aorist tense, it points to the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen, and having been made, I'm in Hebrews 5, 9. And having been made perfect at a point, aorist tense, at a point of salvation, i.e. when I came to grips with the cross, the, the gospel. Listen, that word teleo is what Jesus said on the cross when he cried to the Father at the close of salvation. And he said, it is finished. This is the word he used. He used it in the perfect tense. The writer in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 9, and having been made perfect, he became to all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Who is the source? Jesus Christ. God sent his son so that the son would be the source of eternal salvation. What kind of salvation? Don't miss that word eternal. You got nothing eternal until you have Christ. Point number two, Paul used a word epithaleo as a scriptural meaning out of Philippians 1.6. I explained to you earlier that preposition on front of that word, epi, means to fully complete. That's fully is going way and above. I mean, complete is enough, right? Fully is going way above that. Do you understand that? It's going way above the benchmark. That's a pretty powerful idea. The moment a person believes that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, he re re receives a great salvation that's fully completed. Listen to me. At the point you believe the gospel, you enter a salvation that has been fully completed. You can be confident of that because it's dependent on God. He saved you. He began a great work in you. He will continue it until the day of Christ. Not dependent on you. It's dependent on him. I gave you 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How do you know what the gospel is? There's what it tells you. Romans 1.16 says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Well, anyhow, point number three. God's work of grace salvation begins the moment you believe the gospel and continues until the day of Christ. Paul... Watch this now. Paul in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. We quote two, we always quote 2, 8, 9. Today I want to emphasize 10. 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, is a gift of God. Paul's explained it today to us. Not of works, least any man should boast. It's a gift, not works. Look at verse 10, though. Look at verse 10. We are now his workmanship. We're the creative product. It's like an artist. Let me show you. It's like an artist who wrote a poem that became a song called Amazing Grace that has been sung around the world many, many times. Now watch this. This is what workmanship means. Watch this now. 
for we are his workmanship. For Emma. The English word poem comes from that word. The English word poem comes from that word. It emphasizes the workmanship of God in your life. He's recreated you out of the image of Adam lost into Christ the Savior. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Listen, our hymn book is filled with poetic songs called hymns about the workmanship of God in the life of people. They put the people's names up there, uh, who wrote the words and who wrote the music. We sang one in our opening. We are his workmanship. God has created us into a new person in Christ. We are God's workmanship. We're, 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 we're the image now to bear. We are to bear the image of his son and not the world. We don't bear the image of the world. We bear the image of the son of God. We are God's workmanship. Because we've been saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works. Therefore, we are God's creative identity on earth. You and I bear the image of the Son of Jesus Christ, which is the finished work of God on earth and the humanity of man. I know you didn't get that, but you should have. I know you didn't get it. Now, on our paper, watch this now. Watch this now. In addition to the one confidence of our salvation, I'm going to give you five more. I'm going to give you five more. I'm going to give you five more. Five more after what? What did I just say? I said I gave you the first one already. Can you write that at the top of your paper up there? I've spent an hour with you. I have pounded one idea over and over and over. Would you agree? So what is the first confidence that Paul said you should have about your salvation? It's eternal. It's eternal based on what? The work of God. He starts it. The moment you believe, he starts it. Agreed? Yes. He holds and continues it, right? In, 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 his, in his sovereignty, he starts it in his sovereignty, he continues in his sovereignty, and his sovereignty is going to hold it until what? Rapture. The rapture of the second coming of Christ. That's, that's point number one. It's not on your paper. I gave you an... Uh, it's point one, two, and three. You understand? I didn't give it to you on your paper because you got to do a little bit of thinking. Come on. Do a little bit of thinking with me on it. I wanted you to really grasp what Paul has taught you today. Your salvation is eternal because God starts it, he holds it, and he finishes it. Right? You should have confidence in the character of God. Listen, we don't have confidence in one each other's character. Today we got it, and tomorrow we don't. <laughs> you know? Depends on, it all depends, it depends on the weather in our life. That's not true about God. He says, I'm gonna, I saved you here, I'm going to hold you here until the day of Jesus Christ. Right? That's, that's the first thing you should have confidence. Paul said, I'm so thankful for the confidence I have in God about your salvation. 
I speak that way to you today. You may not be confident, but I'm confident that if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised on the dead third day, God starts it, he holds it, and keeps it till the day of Christ. Some of you are going to be so surprised when the rapture comes and you go up and, don't, and are not left. And you, listen, and that's going to be a good thing. Realize it now. Find your destiny in Christ. What has God got you on this earth for? What is your destiny? Why has he allowed you to live longer than other people in your family? When I go home to Michigan, like I just did, I used to have a long list of people I went to school with. I'm on the short list now. <laughs> There's a short list, and I'm one of the guys on the short list. Why has God left me and taken so many people that I graduated from high school out? Why, why has he left me? I guarantee you, I wasn't voted in high school the guy who would live the longest. I guarantee you that. All right? I wasn't voted for anything except out. I got voted out. The principal voted me out, I guess. Now, let me show you. Besides the one we have out of Philippians 1 6, agreed? There are five more. You should be able to pick one of these and hold on to it and don't let anybody take it away from you. Your salvation is secured in whom? God. God. God in Christ. This is the one that, that I always loved. It got my, the man who led me to Christ, John Haggai, an old Jewish converted evangelist, gave me John 10, 28 through 30. They said, Ron, you're in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God, and no one can take you out. That was my interpretation of those three verses. He said, within a week or two, somebody's going to come by and tell you that you can lose your salvation. You tell them to explain to you John 10, 28 through 30. I guarantee they can't. Do you know he was right? I took my car in to have the oil changed. And once you know, a mechanic said, hey, Ron, I heard you got saved. I come from a small community. And nobody could believe that Rod Anderman got saved. <laughs> I heard you got saved. And I, I got saved. He said, well, you know, you're going to lose it. I said, well, I don't know. I just got saved two, <laughs> two weeks ago. I don't know. I'm thinking about buying a Bible. <laughs> oh no, they're going to have to come down on the price a little bit for me to buy a Bible. I said, but I had a little Bible that the, a little New Testament Bible that the evangelist gave me and he uh, um, wrote in the front of the book, John 10, 28 through 30. Then he folded a part of the top of the paper down <laughs> so I could find it easily of John 10. So I quickly grabbed my Bible. I said, well, I don't know. What do I know? I got this. And I'm, I'm trying to think about buying another Bible, a big one, a full one or whatever they got. And uh, as soon as I get a little money, I, I'm going to buy one. I said, but can you explain that to me since you've gone to church? And I was serious. Since you've gone to, the guy said, ask him to explain it to you. I said, since you've been going to church a long time, could you explain this verse to me? He couldn't. And I went, well, I'm going to keep what I got. Yeah, that's how simple that was. I'm just a simple-minded guy. I said, well, look, look, what do I know? I just know that I was told I'm in the hands of Christ the moment I believed I'm in the hands of Christ. He's in the hands of God. Nobody can get me out of there. And so I figured you're no one, and I have, I've got something. So you can't explain it to me. I can explain it to you. And so I walked away and never got hit again with that because I had me a verse. 
Now that's one. Now you got Philippians 1 6, and now you got you got you got this thing out of God's hands. I give eternal life to them, they shall never perish. No one is able to snatch them out of my hand. My Father who, who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I know Father and one. And that old boy went back to fixing my car. Our theology was over. <laughs> the Word of God settled that deal, and I, w I went out and got me a Bible. That went out and got me a Bible. I said, if it's that easy, I'm going to study a Bible. Here's the other one. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's a gift. It's not by what? Works. It's a gift. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. God gives it to you based on your faith in the Son of God who died on a cross for your sins with burial and raised from the dead third day. You believe it? You got it. Believe and receive. That was point three. God seals. You should read. We did this at Willie's the other day. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22. We did a little Bible study down there. Work out and hear a preacher preach. They go to his gym. That's what they get. They, they get a whole lot of exercise and a whole lot of Bible down there. I highly recommend that gym <laughs> to everybody. You know what's interesting about that little verse? I didn't take Ephesians 1, 13, 14. I usually go to that verse. I like that verse. But because I taught it down at Willie's the other day, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22. Do you know, you know what's in there that's not in Ephesians? They both talk about the sealing of your salvation by the Holy Spirit. You know the difference? In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, 21, 22, while they talk about the sealing and the pledging, like Ephesians, they talk about the anointing, the charisma. Talks about the anointing. It talks about the anointing, the charisma, the, the anointing that comes through, that comes from God to His Son, to the Holy Spirit, to you. <laughs> The charisma, the anointing that comes from God through His Son, through the Holy Spirit to every church age believer. The anointing. You know that you have an anointing from God among many things. And do you know that that anointing through the Holy Spirit seals you unto the day of redemption? That anointing Seals you unto the day of redemption. <laughs> oh, people. Don't let the devil buy you with a bowl of soup. Don't let him buy you with a bowl of soup. In that first, in that second, second Corinthians 1 21, 22, he gives you four things. I just mentioned one, a couple of them. He who established us with you in Christ, who anoints us in God, who seals us, gave us the Holy Spirit in our heart as a pledge. <laughs> That's four great gifts, all wrapped up into one big Christmas. How wonderful. Then we have God's well of living water. God's well of living water. You can read about it in John 4:14, 4, where Jesus met the woman at the well and got her in a discussion, natural uh, drinking water versus spiritual drinking water of eternal life. Got her in this wonderful conversation, said, you know, you can walk away with a well in you. She went like, give me that deal. <laughs> I come down here three times a day. I carry this water bottle. Oh, up and down a hill. Give me that well. If I can have that well and not come back to this, <laughs> give me that well. He said, yeah, boy. And she went away with the well in her. And we went back. She brought the whole, the whole city of Sychar, brought the whole city down to meet this man called Jesus that can put the well in you, can take Jacob's well and put it in you. <laughs> yeah. 
that artesian well of the Spirit of God inside you. Listen, John, the seventh chapter, verses 37 through 39, he talks, Jesus talks about it. Talks about this well. He talks about this well. Now in the last days, he said, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. But the Spirit had not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. In other words, raised from the dead and gone back to seat, seat with God at the right hand. To heaven and seated at the right hand of God. The well's in you. Listen to me. And you know who should be coming to your life? You know who should be coming to your well? Lost people. Like the woman at the well who came to a well of the world to get a drink because she was thirsty. And Jesus gave her a well that could never go dry. That would lead to an abundant life. Write this down, John 10.10. 10. Because this water, this living water that Jesus talked about is the abundant life in Christ. An abundant life in Christ. Do you have any idea what this living well can do for you? Listen to me. It'll bring you into the abundance of life. You'll find things about life you would have never known apart from Christ. But listen, the importance of the living well is for other people to come so that you can put the well in them that comes when they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people will bring you thirsty people that need a drink of water, and you need to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be ambassadors of that. And then, finally, God's Son. Watch this now. Watch this now. Did I write it down? I wrote it down. I, I spoil you so bad. Yeah, down on your bottom. Watch this. First John five eleven through thirteen. Listen to what it says. Watch this now. This is the testimony that God has given us. Who gave us eternal life? This life, eternal life is in his son. Where's eternal life? In Jesus Christ. He who has the son has life. How do you get the son? You got to believe the gospel. He who has the son has eternal life. He who does not have the son of God does not have eternal life. Well, Horton gave you the other. I was trying to be nice to you. These things I have written to you, 1 John 5, 11 through 30, watch this. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. How do I know? The Bible says so. Just like that old mechanic. When he said, yeah, you probably could lose that thing. Eh, you got to watch out, boy. You got to be on your toes. I went, can you explain the scriptures to me? I just, what do I know? Hmm. I'll tell you, I know this. That if I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I have the son. And the son has me. And if I have the son, I have eternal life. If I'm in Christ, if any man be in Christ... Moment of salvation. I become a new creation. I have eternal life. I have it from then because of the work of God. I have it now and I will have it to the day of Christ. Don't let anybody steal it from you. Get one, at least one of these six things like I did. When somebody tells you, you know, pop that scripture on and say, explain that to me. And if you can't, then explain it to them. I said, I don't know. I just know that I'm in the hands of Christ who's in the hands of God, and no one could get me out. No one could get me out. 
And he said, well, you could get yourself out. I said, how, how would that be? I did get myself in it. How's that going to work? I didn't, I didn't get in nothing. I didn't climb into anything. I just believed. And I got it. Well, Father, we're so thankful for these that have come today and studied with us the confidence of salvation. We should be so thankful. Oh, I'm so thankful. I pray that others would enter that confidence that is in good hands. It's in the hands of God. It's in the hands of his son. It's in the sovereignty of God that my salvation is kept. Not in the hands of man, not even my own. I've been bought with a price, a terrible price. In the human suffering of Christ on the cross for my sins, then I might be freed from the wages of sin and the wrath because of the grace of God. I'm so thankful for that for my people. I pray today that we walk away here with a thankful heart, with confidence of our salvation. It's eternal because the source is Christ in God. Oh, Father, help us do that. When we take this offering today, Father, may we good stewards spend a little on ourselves and most on reaching the world for Christ. That's Moody, that's Sinclair, that's the state of Alabama. That's America. We need to be missionaries to America and to the uttermost parts of the earth. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen.